So we're going to be finishing up the chapter uh, on cells, chapter 3. So this is uh, the, the last part of the, the chapter, part C. Um, if you haven't seen it already, please be sure to look at part A and part B. Also, if you would like an exam review, please make sure you leave, uh, uh, let me know in the comments below or you can email me directly. Um, so um, moving forward with the last part, since in the, the previous two parts we primarily we spoke about uh, uh, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, what it's made up of and how things are able to move in and move out of the cell. Uh, now we're actually going to, we're going to get past the plasma membrane and now we're going to be looking at what do we find uh, 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 after the plasma membrane. So now we're going to be looking at uh, the, the nucleus and we're going to be looking at the, the, the cytoplasm and uh, what, uh, what the cytoplasm is made up of uh, and uh, what goes on over here. Uh, so all the cellular material, material that's located between the plasma membrane and the nucleus is called the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm ma is made up of three uh, main things. Uh, first off, you have a fluid. It's a gel-like fluid uh, that uh, we call the cytosol. Okay? So uh, it's made up primarily of water. In addition to that, we also have particles, uh, molecules such as protein, salts, uh, and some sugars. Uh, and this fluid, it provides um, the medium for uh, the other structures that you find within the, the cytoplasm to move about and, uh, to move about and, and for all the chemical reactions to take place. Uh, aside from that, we also have uh, certain inclusion, uh, inclusions, and these inclusions, we're referring to some uh, insoluble molecules. Now, this varies with the type of cell that you're, that you're looking at. So, for example, if you're looking at some liver cells, you might find glyc uh, glycogen granules. If you're looking at uh, fat cells, you might find some lipid droplets. Uh, pigments you'll find in like your, uh, your, uh, your uh, skin cells and uh, your hair. Uh, so, Again, depending on the cell, you find various things. Crystals and vacuoles are also found in other types of cells. Uh, and then we have organelles. Now, the organelles, this is, this is the machinery, okay? The metabolic machinery that keeps the cell functioning. Uh, depending on the cell, you're going to find different types of organelles. Uh, these organelles, they could be either membranous or they could be non-membranous. Meaning, they either have a membrane or they don't have, they lack a membrane. So these organelles, they, again, like I said earlier, um, uh, there are so many different types of organelles uh, within a, a cell. And again, depending on the cell, you're going to find different organelles present. But they're very specialized as to what they do. So they're all very specific, they, they all have very specific function, functions that they pr perform in order to, to keep that cell living and for that cell to function uh, as it does, okay? It makes that cell unique. So let's look at some of these cytoplasmic organelles. First, let's look at the membrane-bound organelles. So you have the mitochondria, then there's the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, there's two types. There's a rough endoplasmic reticulum and a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, also, you know, we're gonna be abbreviating, uh, we call the, the endoplasmic reticulum ER. So it's the rough ER or the smooth ER. There's also the Golgi, uh, the Golgi apparatus. Some people call it the Golgi apparatus. Uh, there's also peroxisomes, the lysosomes. Um, aside from this, then we have the, the non-membraneous. Non-membraneous mem uh, organelles, they include ribosomes, uh, yeah, cytoskeletons, and centrioles. So the job of these membranes is that it encloses it. It compartmentalizes uh, the organelle. Uh, so it is it, going to isolate it and it allows it to do uh, its function within an isolated space. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, the importance, this is what the, one of the main importance for, for the membrane. Uh, aside from that, uh, some of the, lipid, the, the lipids that we find that make up this membrane, it also allows for organelles to communicate with one another. So the mitochondria, uh, this is the powerhouse of the cell. Okay? That's what they call, people refer to it, or the power plant of the cell. The reason they call it this is because all the energy of the, the, that the cell needs is going to be produced over here. Uh, and that's uh, in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And this is an oxygen requiring uh, process. So it's, we, we, uh, the, we say that it's aerobic. Okay, When it requires oxygen, a cell requires oxygen, then that's aerobic. And when there's no oxygen, uh, anaerobic. So uh, this process of producing ATP occurs uh, via uh, aerobic, cellular respiration. 
Um, it's a double membrane. The outer membrane is very smooth and it's, uh, it doesn't really serve that much of a function. Uh, no, well, it does, but you know, the, the, it's, it's featureless. Uh, the inner membrane, however, it has lots of folds that are called cristae. Now, uh, on these cristae, we also find lots of uh, proteins that are embedded within it. And they play the main, uh, they play a role in, in producing, uh, in, in cellular respiration. Uh, the mitochondria also, you're going to find DNA and RNA and ribosomes here as well. And the reason that it has this is because they're able to replicate themselves all, all on their own. Uh, in that, with that sense, they resemble the bacteria because they are capable of the same type of division that bacteria use. They divide by what we, what we see in bacteria, uh, termed fission. I have a picture of a mitochondria, and uh, if you look at it, first of all, the, just look at the shape. It's a bean-shaped structure. Uh, the other thing that we notice is that you have um, um, uh, the, the double membrane. This is the outer membrane. Notice that it's quite smooth. The inner membrane it form, forms these folds. Again, these are the, what we call the cristae. And on that, again, when you look at it, you'll see enzymes and also see ribosomes and DNA, and you'll see RNA also, but they don't have it labeled over here. Uh, so keep in mind, this cell is making all the energy. Uh, it's providing all the energy that a cell needs. Okay, this organelle, I'm sorry if I said cell, but this organelle, this tool uh, of that of a cell provides all the energy requirements for a cell. So if you're in the case of a, a liver cell uh, or a, a muscle cell where you know the energy requirements are high, there's you're gonna find a lot, you're gonna find many more ribos uh, the mitochondria than a cell that's not as active. So less active cells will have uh, less mitochondria than more active cells. Uh, a red blood cell, for example, does not have a mitochondria at all. It has no energy needs. Uh, mitochondria, uh, the, the red blood cell, it, it's just a transporter cell. And uh, ox, uh, uh, blood, whole blood, blood plasma, is uh, and the, the, the pumping action of the heart, uh, which moves whole blood, uh, transports the red blood cells around. Ribosomes are non-membranous organelles uh, that are the site of protein synthesis. And they're made up of protein and uh, ribosomal RNA. Uh, there's two switchable forms that we find in a cell. Uh, there's either free ribosomes, which float about freely, and this is uh, where uh, protein, uh, soluble proteins, uh, proteins that, uh, that, that function in the cytosol, or proteins uh, that are needed for their organelles are produced. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other type of uh, 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 ribosomes we have are the membrane-bound ribosomes. Now, membrane-bound uh, ribosomes, these are, uh, rib uh, these are the ribosomes that produce uh, proteins that are going to be uh, either incorporated into this, the plasma membrane or they're going to be exported somewhere else, uh, exported out of the cell. So again, remember, we have two types of ribosomes. They're either membrane-bound or non-membrane-bound. Uh, for the membrane-bound uh, ribosomes, you're going to find them on uh, the rough end of plasma reticulum, for example, the rough ER. And what are they doing? They're producing uh, proteins that, is, that are going to be exported out of the cell or that are going to be incorporated within uh, the, the, the plasma membrane. The free ribosomes, remember, they're making proteins uh, for uh, the, the cytosol that you find uh, floating within the cytosol to function for that or other organelles. So please remember that. It's a very good question that to be found on an exam. So now let's talk about the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. Now remember, there's two types. You have a rough ER and a smooth ER that I men mentioned earlier. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes attached to it. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they lack uh, or they don't have the ribosomes attached to it. So naturally, uh, their functions will be different. Now when you look at the, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, you're going to see that it's continuous with the outer nuclear membrane of the nucleus. Uh, it's made up of a series of parallel interconnected cisterns, and uh, these cisterns, they're, they're flat, uh, they're, they're membranous uh, uh, tubes that are filled with fluids. Um, and again, so when this is where, uh, again, if you're looking at uh, the rough ER, this is where you're going to find uh, protein synthesis uh, for uh, the, the proteins that are getting exported out of the cell take place over here. So this is the place of interest for us to look at. So we're going to be going into detail about that. Uh, so let's look at each one of these individually. So again, 
Uh, this is the, notice this is the entire cell. That's the nucleus over here. And if you look closely, you'll see that, and you can see it better over here. This is the nuclear envelope. And notice that it's continuous, this endoplasmic retic reticulum, with the nucleus, uh, the, the nuclear envelope of the nucleus. Uh, and there you have it right over here. And you can see these sacs, again, they're, they're folded. Kind of looks like the cisterns that we saw in, in, in the mitochondria. Uh, uh, resembles that a little bit. Uh, in addition, you can see the ribosomes that are attached to it. So because these there is ribosomes attached to it, it's rough looking in appearance, we term it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, this is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Again, they, 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 uh, the smooth ER, it lacks, it does not have the, the ribosomes attached to it. So again, it has a smooth appearance. So if you look over here, uh, this is the rough ER right over here, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is the nucleus over here. And notice all the little uh, ribosomes that you see. This is the dark little, the, the, the bumpy spots that you see over here. And then you can see the smooth ER over here as well. So all this area over here is all the smooth ER. So the rough ER, uh, the external surface appears rough. It looks rough because, again, of all these ribosomes that are attached to it. It gives it the studded appearance. Again, this is where uh, proteins uh, uh, that are going to be uh, export out of the cell are produced. This is where they're synthesized. Uh, the site of synthesis for a lot of the plasma membrane proteins and phospholipids also occurs over here on the rough ER. Uh, proteins, they come in, to, uh, they enter the cisterns uh, as they're synthesized and they get modified as they go through the fluid filled tubes. The final protein, it ends up getting enclosed in a vesicle and it gets sent out of the rough ER to the Golgi apparatus for further processing. And we're going to be looking at that to see what happens. Uh, the Golgi apparatus then ends up packaging and making makes a handful of modifications and packages and then it finally ships it out of the cell. Um, so yes, this is the rough uh, ER. So the next type of uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, um, when you look at it, it's, uh, it's, it's a network of loop tubules. Again, it's all it's continuous with the rough uh, ER. Uh, the enzymes that you find on its uh, plasma membrane, uh, the integral proteins, um, they do not synthesize proteins, okay? They, it plays a different role. What the smooth ER does is that it accelerates, okay, or it catalyzes uh, the, for the, the, the reactions for the following things, for lipid metabolism, for cholesterol, uh, cholesterol steroid-based hormone production, uh, uh, for making lipids uh, for uh, lipoproteins, also in absorption and synthesizing and transporting fats, uh, the smooth ER is also uh, catalyzes reactions for uh, detoxification of chemicals such as pesticides and drugs. Uh, also, it's uh, very, very important for converting glycogen to free glyco uh, glucose. Uh, in addition to that, it uh, provides uh, acts as a storage uh, reserve and release uh, and release uh, of uh, calcium. So, for example, the storage and releasing of calcium, you're going to find lots of smooth ER. Uh, a lot of these cells in uh, your uh, uh, cardiac muscle and, and skeletal muscle. Um, so uh, within the within the cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle, it's termed sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's a specialized smooth ER that you find within these two types of uh, muscle tissue. Um, now, um, also in the liver, for example, you're going to find a lot of smooth ER in the liver as well. Uh, Let's see, also, yeah, you know, actually I didn't mention, but uh, going back here to the rough ER, I, I mentioned in the smooth ER a couple places that you find uh, these uh, type of cells. But, for example, in the liver, uh, you're going to find a lot of rough ER also over there. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the secretory cells, you'll find high amounts of uh, uh, rough ER. Uh, also, in antibody-producing antibody plasma cells, you're going to tend to find a lot of uh, rough ER uh, too. Now we're going to be looking at the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus, in appearance, it's a stacked and flattened membranous cistern sac. Uh, now, the, one of the important things about this is that it has two ends, or uh, the, what we call faces. It has a, uh, a cis face, which receives the products from, the, uh, from the, uh, the rough ER, and then it has a trans face, okay, or an outer face, that ships off uh, the, the complete product uh, out of the Golgi apparatus. Uh, so what does the Golgi apparatus do? It modifies, it concentrates, and it packages proteins and lipids that it receives from the rough ER. There's three steps that are involved in this. 
Uh, first of all, as I uh, said earlier, uh, with the vesicles that are shipped out of the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the transfer vesicles, they come and they fuse uh, with the, the cis phase of the, uh, the Golgi apparatus. Afterwards, um, the next thing that's going to happen is the contents from that ER, uh, uh, from the, the rough ER, uh, it will then be uh, further processed. In that, we're saying that the proteins and lipids, for example, they end up getting further modified. Um, sometimes you're also going to have sugars. Sugars will be either cut up or sometimes they end up getting uh, added to to make them bigger. Other times, they end up getting a, a phosphate uh, the, uh, added to it. Um, once that's taken place, so once the, the proteins, the lipids, the sugars, once they've been modified, then they end up getting tagged for wherever they're going to be delivered to. Uh, after they're tagged or they're addressed to where they're supposed to go to, they end up getting sorted. After they're sorted, then they end up getting packaged. After this point, the role of the Golgi apparatus further gets uh, complex in that it's going to act as a tra traffic director in uh, controlling where these packages are going to be going to. And they take uh, one of three different pathways. Uh, so the, that, the, the, the final package is going to leave uh, the Golgi apparatus, as I mentioned earlier, through the trans phase. So remember, things come in from the cis phase and they exit from the trans phase. So here you see, this is your Golgi apparatus, this is the photo of it, and you see a vesicle from the, uh, from the rough ER, a transfer vesicle, it ends up fusing to the Golgi apparatus, and in the contents it ends up uh, entering uh, the, the, the cis phase of the Golgi apparatus. So over here, when it's flowing through the cisterns of that apparatus, it'll end up getting modified. Uh, after it's modified, uh, then you know it's going to end up getting uh, packaged, so if you, when you follow the diagram, uh, when you come towards the, notice the faces also, so this is the cis face, the receiving end, and this is the trans face, okay, uh, the shipping end. So over here, notice that these, uh, the, these uh, vesicles are starting to form, and as the, the, the proteins or, lip, or whatever ends up, the products end up coming here, they get pinched off, then they're ready for export. Uh, and this is how they're exported out. So depending on the contents, uh, the final transport vesicle can take one of three pathways. The first pathway that we talk about, pathway A, the secretary vesicle that contains the proteins uh, and it needs to be shipped out of the cell, it's going to go to the plasma membrane and by exocytosis, the, the, uh, the, the, the product gets shipped out of the cell. The second pathway, pathway B, uh, when the product is going to be used for the plasma membrane, so if it's either a protein or a lipid, for example, uh, that vesicle, the, the vesicle that, that contains either the lipid or the, or the, the, the transmembrane protein, it's going to go and fuse with the plasma membrane and then it inserts whatever it has inside of it right directly into the into that membrane into the plasma membrane this the last uh, uh, pathway pathway C lysosomes that contain digestive enzymes they stay inside the cell and they just they hold their uh, contents within that vent vesicle until they're needed to be used so when you look over here uh, again, the, the, the steps that it's showing is, uh, is this. Um, well, we already talked about this. Again, remember, the, the rough ER, what ends up happening is uh, the protein-containing vesicles, they pinch off the ER, okay? Once they pinch off, uh, the, the, the vesicles pinch off the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they migrate towards the, the Golgi apparatus, and they fuse with the Golgi apparatus. Once they fuse with the, with the, the Golgi apparatus, <clears throat> the contents will enter the, the cisterns uh, of the, the apparatus, and then they end up getting modified, okay, within these compartments. After they've been modified, then they end up getting, uh, uh, are packaged okay, within the different uh, vesicles, okay, the type of vesicles that are here, depending on where it's ultimately going to lead to. So the first pathway, remember, if it wants to go outside of the cell, then it ends up getting packaged into uh, this vesicle here, that ends up attaching to the plasma membrane, and then it's going to end up shipping out of the cell, okay. The second pathway, uh, uh, where is the second pathway B? Okay, there we go. Pathway B. Uh, so, for example, within the, the, the products within here, perhaps there's some integral proteins that the plasma membrane needs, or some uh, lipid, uh, lipids that the plasma membrane needs. Once it gets, uh, once this vesicle 
uh, gets uh, produced and its contents are full, then it's going to go to that plasma membrane and then it ends up getting incorporated within that plasma membrane. Okay. The third type is whenever, let's say there's lysosomes, okay? So the lysosomes enter the vesicle, and then again, the little pinch, get pinched off the, 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 the Golgi apparatus, and then it's gonna remain within the, cyto, the, the, cytopla, the, the cytoplasm of the cell. And then when the time comes, let's say a bacteria comes, okay, a phagosome enters, uh, not a bacteria, but a phagosome enters the cell, then the lysosome is gonna go and attach itself uh, to uh, the phagosome, and then it will hyd hydrolyze the contents of it, uh, of, uh, of, that, uh, uh, of that phagosome. So these are the three things that will happen. Organelles we're going to be looking at are peroxisomes. Now, peroxisomes, they're membranous sacs that contain powerful detoxifying substances uh, that neutralize toxins such as alcohols and formaldehyde uh, and free radicals. Now free radicals, these are very toxic, very highly reactive molecules. Uh, they are natural byproducts of cellular metabolism, but again, they cause a lot of havoc within the cell if they're not detoxified. So peroxisomes, uh, the two main detoxifiers uh, that uh, we have that it contains are oxidase and catalases. So oxys the oxidase, it uses oxygen, O2, to convert toxin into uh, H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. <clears throat> Pro hydrogen peroxide is also uh, toxic, however, uh, in peroxisomes, it also has catalase. So what ends up happening is uh, the catalase then it'll convert the peroxide into water into H2O. Uh, peroxisomes they also play a very important role in breaking down and building up fatty acids. Uh, peroxisomes you're gonna find them uh, concentrated in, in liver cells and kidney cells. Uh, both these organs they're very they're very active, uh, and the reason you find a lot of them is because you know they're both these organs uh, they're doing a lot of detoxification there. Lysosomes, they're spherical membranous bags that contain digestive enzymes uh, that are termed acid hydrolases uh, because they work best in acidic conditions. Now, the, the membrane that's, uh, that you find in the lysosomes uh, are very special. Uh, they're important in two, two ways. First of all, these membranes, they contain hydrogen pumps. Now, these hydrogen pumps, which are ATPases, they gather hydrogen ions from the surrounding cytosol that helps maintain the, the acidic pH uh, of the cytosol. The next thing, secondly, it ends up retaining the, 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 the dangerous acid hydrolases while it permits the final product of digestion to escape. In this way, uh, it provides a safe uh, area uh, or a safe zone uh, where um, the, the, the digestion it can take place safely inside the cell. Lysosomes, they're able to digest a broad range of biological material. Uh, they're able to break down or ingest, uh, they're able to digest ingested bacteria, viruses, and toxins. Uh, they're even able to degrade other non-functional organelles as they're, you know, they're, they're worn out or they end, uh, they're, uh, they're at the end of their life cycle. Uh, metabolic functions, they're able to break down and release glycogen. Uh, same thing, uh, they're able to break down uh, and release uh, calcium from bone too. Uh, when the cell, when an, when a cell is injured, the cell wall, while you know, while it's very important, while it serves as two important uh, functions that I mentioned earlier, it, however, is somewhat fragile. So if that cell wall uh, does rupture, then the entire cell will end up, unfortunately, getting uh, destroyed, or the cell will die. Uh, so the other way that 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 can occur is this. When the cell is deprived of oxygen, or when there's very high levels of vitamin A, both those things will cause the rupture of that membrane. And then that membrane, uh, uh, when the lysosome is released, the entire cells die. That's referred to as uh, autolysis. And we see this uh, occurring, autolysis. For example, uh, when uh, the fetus is developing, when the fetus, it has uh, the webs that you find between uh, the fingers and the toes. Uh, that, again, is because of lysosome, okay, autolysis, that, that web is able to be digested uh, as the fetus further develops. So in this slide, again, these are uh, pictures of lysosomes, and when you look at uh, the, the, this lysosome, uh, notice again, remember, it is membrane-bound uh, organelle, 
And then these green areas that you see over here, these are uh, regions where there's a lot of metabolic activity taking place. In other words, materials are being digested at that point, uh, 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 at these spaces over here, there, there, there. So lysosomal storage disease results when one or more lysosomal digestive enzymes are mutated and they don't function as they should. Tay-Sachs disease, uh, this is a condition where the patient, uh, they lack the lysosomal enzymes that are needed to break down glycolipids in the brain. Uh, when you have these glycolipids that start to build up, this interferes with normal nervous system function. You tend to see this uh, in uh, uh, individuals of uh, Euro Central European Jewish descent. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is that these individuals, uh, they will be mentally retarded. They will, uh, you know, it uh, will lead to blindness. Um, you'll see seizures uh, quite off frequent in these individuals and uh, death at an early age. Unfortunately, uh, you know, usually the, the, the individuals with this uh, condition, they end up dying uh, before age five. Uh, endomembrane system. So this is made up of uh, membranous organelles that we talked about earlier. Uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, the Golgi apparatus, uh, secretory ve vesicles and lysosomes, uh, as well as the, the nuclear and plasma membranes. Uh, these membranes and organelles, they work together. So what do they do? Well, they're producing, uh, they're degrading, they're storing, uh, and they're exporting uh, biological molecules. Uh, as we saw earlier, you know, for both uh, the lysosomes and the peroxisomes that we discussed about, uh, the, you know, they form these structures that are very important in degrading uh, either, you know, um, uh, pathogens or, or other uh, uh, dangerously, uh, potentially harmful substances. Uh, so these membrane, the, these membranes you find in all these organ-bound, uh, these, uh, these membrane-bound organelles, uh, without them, again, you, we wouldn't have what we have, these organelles working with one another, or even, even the, the functions that these organelles have. They wouldn't be present without them having these, uh, their, their own membrane system, these endomembranes that we call. So when we're talking about the endomembrane system, we're talking about all the mem membranes in the organelles that, we've, that we discussed so far. So the, the ER, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, uh, the secretory vesicles, the lysosomes, uh, the peroxisomes. Um, so uh, in addition to that, even the nuclear and the plasma membranes, uh, these membranes and organelles, they work together. Again, without these, the, 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 these endomembranes, these organelles wouldn't be able to function as they, as they are. Uh, so they wouldn't be able to produce, they wouldn't be able to degrade, they wouldn't be able to store and export these bio biological molecules. Uh, so again, they're extremely important. So when you look over here, again, look at the smooth uh, ER. It's got the membrane. Uh, again, we talk about the membrane that we, again, that's continuous with the, with the, with the nucleus. Uh, the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria. Uh, again, it's extremely important uh, that these, uh, uh, these organelles are membrane bound. The skeleton, it's an elaborate network of rods that run throughout the cytosol. Uh, they act as the cell's bones, muscles, and ligaments by providing the cell structures and providing, uh, providing with the machinery to generate various cell uh, movements. Now, the three types of rods that we see uh, that are part of the cytoskeleton are, now, th th this is an order going from smallest to largest, are the microfilaments, the intermediate filaments, and then the microtubules. Microfilaments, these are the thinnest of all the cytoskeleton elements. Uh, they're roughly about seven nanometers uh, in width. Um, when uh, they are, however, uh, semi-flexible and they're per made of the protein actin. Uh, each cell is very unique into the arrangement of strands that it has. So no two, uh, no two cells are gonna, are gonna have the same arrangement of uh, these microfilaments. However, uh, they do share a common terminal web. And you, what you find over here uh, in all cells at this terminal well, they're alike. So you see a dense cross-linked ne network of microfilaments that are attached to the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane. And what this does is that it strengthens the, the cell surface and it also helps resist compression. Now, some of these 
uh, microfilms. They're involved in, in the cell motility. So it, it helps changes the shape of the cell. Uh, also, in, for example, when we d talked about uh, uh, the amoeboid uh, uh, motion, it's because of these microfilaments. They're the ones that are causing and, and, and allow uh, the cell to have this amoe amoeboid uh, motion by way of the cams. Uh, uh, the micro uh, the, the microtool is being attached to the cams. Uh, in addition to that, you also uh, can find this uh, in uh, during uh, cell division when the the cell is uh, is about to split when the cleavage furrows f are forming. Uh, this is also because of the microfilaments. Uh, so it's a very important uh, 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 structure uh, that you have. Uh, same thing again. They're involved in endocytosis and exocytosis, uh, exocytosis too. Uh, so here you go, this is a, uh, an actin subunit and you're going to find this in muscle cells also, this actin myosin complexes that form uh, in, in muscle contraction. Uh, so notice again, there are about 7 nanometers uh, and this is, a, if, you, if you look over here, uh, a microfilament uh, in a, uh, from the blue bat-like network that, that they call, kind of looks like a bat uh, in, in this picture. Um, so let's look at the next uh, filament. These are uh, of the, uh, in that we find inside of cell skeletons. Uh, are uh, um, intermediate filaments. So again, this, the size, as the name suggests, is in between uh, the biggest and the smallest. So it's right in between. In, it's roughly about 10 nanometers uh, uh, in width. So the, they're tough, they're insoluble, and they're more of a, a rope-like uh, protein fibers. Uh, they're made up of uh, tetramers, again, that's four uh, fibrils that are twisted together to make one really strong, uh, one strong fiber. And because of this property, they have a high tensile strength. Uh, so it helps cells resist uh, the pulling force. So the film is attached to desmosome plaques and they act as internal guy wires. Uh, some of them have special names. So for example, in nerve cells, uh, they're referred to as neurofilaments. And then in the, in the uh, epithelial cells, uh, or, um, they're called uh, uh, keratin filaments and again we get these different names because of the uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me because of the, the, the various types of filaments uh, that these uh, uh, the intermediate fibers are, are made up of again depending on the, the, the cells that they're found and then in this slide you can see intermediate filaments again notice that they're made up of uh, uh, four fibrils and these are the tetramers uh, that they're made up of uh, and uh, again, they're about 10 nanometers in width. Uh, and in this uh, picture over here, you can see the intermediate filaments that are form forming the network that surrounds the, the nucleus over here. So microtubules are the largest of the cytoskeletal elements. Uh, they're made up of hollow tubes that are made up of uh, protein subunits called tubulins. Uh, these are constantly being assembled and disassembled. Uh, most of them, they radiate from the centrosome area of the cell, which is near the nucleus. And they help determine the overall uh, sh uh, shape of the cell, in addition to the distribution of the organs. Uh, that, but the reason being that uh, the the micro uh, the these microtubules, uh, the organelles, they're they're tethered on onto them to, to to keep them in in, in place. Uh, these microtubules, uh, they also move. Uh, they they move uh, the, these or uh, the the uh, other organelles uh, throughout the cell also. So many substances are moved throughout the cell by these motor proteins. So they act kind of like train engines, and they, uh, it's like a train engine and a train track. So say so they use the microtubules as a tracks, and then these uh, these proteins they power uh, the substance to, to 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 move throughout. So again, it's 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 a very efficient system. So here you go over here. You see. These are the, the, the microtubule, these are the subunits that, is, that they're made up of. And notice that these are, these are the thickest. In width, they're about 25, they're 25 nanometers. Uh, so over here, you'll see them uh, appearing as uh, gold structures, uh, and they're surrounding the nuclei over here again. So these motor proteins, again, uh, they're complexes that function in the motility. And functionally and structurally, they are linked to these microtubules. So think of them as kind of like engines or, or these train engines uh, that, that are moving throughout these microtubules. Uh, so they can help in, in, in the movement of organelles and other substances around the cell. Uh, so if an organelle needs to move from one place to the, uh, to the other, these motor proteins, they're going to be pushing them 
on the track uh, of the microtubule. Uh, so again, it uses the, 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 these microtubules as their tracks, okay? And the cargo could be, again, it could be another organelle. They are powered by ATP. So again, it's, it's an energy uh, using process. So centrosomes and centrioles. Centrosomes, uh, which are located near the nucleus, essentially translate into meaning uh, cell centers. So what happens is, is that they serve as an organizing center for the microtubules. They're made up of a granular matrix and centrioles. Centrioles are a pair of barrel-shaped microtubule organelles that lie at a 90 degree angles to one another. Uh, so newly assembled microtubules, they radiate from the centrosome to the rest of the cell. Uh, some of these microtubules, they eat in cell divisions, uh, while others, they form cytical skeletal tract systems. Uh, we're gonna be talking about cilia and flagella, and these centrioles also form the basis for both uh, cilia and flagella. When you look at this picture over here, this is the matrix for the centrosome, and these are the microtubules around, and then these are the centrioles. Notice they're at a 90 degree angle. Now, each one of these, uh, uh, these centrioles, they're made up of a, a triplet of microtubules. Okay, so one, two, three. One, two, three. And there's nine of these that form in a, in a star-shaped uh, uh, pinwheel. Uh, the center is hollow. This is an electron micrograph uh, showing you a cross-section of a, of a centriole. And again, you can see the triplets here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, uh, th they're going around uh, and they form this, uh, this, uh, uh, this star-shaped spindle. So now we're gonna be talking about cellular extensions. So certain cells, they have structures extending from the cell surface. And they could be one of three things. Uh, sometimes you'll find cilia and flagella present on cells. Other times you'll find microvilli. So cilia, what they do is that they move things across the surface of a cell. Flagella, on the other hand, it moves the entire cell. Now microvilli, uh, these are uh, their finger-like projections that extend from the surface of the cell. And what they do is they increase the surface area. So now we're going to be looking at each one of these things in detail. So cilia, they, are like, they have like a whip-like uh, motion uh, on the surface of the cell, such as the cells that line your respiratory system. Uh, so thousands of these cilia, they work together in a sweeping motion to move, in this example, the respiratory system, to move mucus across the surface of that cell in one direction. Usually you're moving it out. Of the, so in, in the case of uh, the respiratory system, these cells are moving uh, upwards, okay? Uh, they're moving uh, the mucus uh, from within your lungs and the tissue out up into your throat. That's the, the way that the, the, the cilia are moving. Flagella, on the other hand, uh, they're much longer extensions uh, than the cilia, and they propel, they move an entire cell. So the example of flagella that you find uh, in humans are sperm cells. Okay, Sperm cells, they move the entire cell, entire sperm cell, uh, in, you know, it's, it's taking it to the egg to fertilize. Now, both these structures are made up, made up of microtubules that are synthesized by the centrioles called the basal bodies because they form the base of each cilium and flagellum. So cilia and flagella, they both have a 9-2, what we call a 9 plus 2 pattern of microtubules. So nine sets of double tubes that are surrounding a pair of uh, doublets. So a slightly different form of a 9-0 pattern of a centriole where you have nine triplets with no tubules in the center. Um, so cilia movements alternate between power stroke and a recovery stroke. So well, what this does is, uh, this alteration, it makes a current at the cell surface that moves substances upwards, okay, or forward. So in this picture, again, you can see the nine doublets uh, over here, and then the two central, central microtubules. Um, so now, uh, what you see here is, uh, this is a, uh, a cilia, and you see that it goes, in, in, so this is the, the first thing that you see, it steps one through four is a power stroke. So notice how it goes, it, it, it's bending forwards or med, bending down, downwards. Imagine the opening is over here, uh, opening of a cavity, for example, since we're talking about the respiratory system, uh, and this way it's going towards the lungs. So number one, it's straight up, it's, it's uh, at a 90 degree angle to the surface of the cell. Then it moves uh, closer and closer and closer to the surface of the cell. So this is this power stroke. The recovery is when it ends up moving back up. So five, six, seven, it's gonna end up moving back to that original position. Uh, 
So again, this is what's happening here when you can when you see over here, these cells are coming uh, downwards and then they have come back upwards and they come back down and then they come back up. So this is constant mo going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth that as the mucus is, is, is coming to the surface, it's being pushed forward. So microvilli, now on the other hand, microvilli, these are finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane. And what they do is they increase the absorption, the, the surface area uh, of that cell. So in places like the kidney and intestines where absorption needs to take place, this is most important. Uh, they have a core of actin microfil uh, microfilaments that are, also, that are used for stiffening uh, uh, these projections uh, upwards for and, and you know to hold them in place. So when you look over here, these are these microvilli. And notice all these finger-like extensions. Every time you know when they're going up and down, they're just increasing the surface area of the cell. Um, so now we have all you know this entire area for you know these nutrients to to uh, to sit on uh, sit upon and and get absorbed inside. So again, uh, these are the microvilli up uh, over here. And then you can see these actin filaments that are helping them stand up, that are, that are anchoring them. And then you have a terminal web uh, that these actin filaments are, are attached to. And if you remember, we said that actin was a, you know, it's one of the proteins that you find in contraction. Uh, in this case, in, in microvilli, they don't contract, but again, they're just there to stiffen it up, stiffen up the, the, these uh, microvilli in place. And again, this, the, the terminal web, you know, that they're connecting, it's just part of the cytoskeleton. So the nucleus, this is the largest organelle in the cell. Uh, if your brain is a control center for your body, then this nucleus is the control center uh, for, for the cell. Uh, it has the entire blueprint for how to make all the proteins that you find in your body. It responds to signals that dictate the kind of and the amount of proteins that need to be made. Uh, most cells are uninucleate, meaning that you know they have uh, one nucleus. However, some cells like your skeletal muscle cells and uh, your uh, bone breaking cells, uh, your osteoclasts, they're multinucleated. Uh, your liver cells also, they're multinucleated. Um, then you have uh, your red blood cells on the other hand that do not have a nucleus. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. Mature red blood cells, they are anucleate, meaning uh, re mature red blood cells, they do not have a nucleus. When it, uh, a red blood cell is first produced, okay, uh, an immature red blood cell, it has a nucleus, but just about, at the, just after uh, the red blood cell is produced and it matures and is about to enter the, 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 the bloodstream, what happens is uh, the nucleus, it, it exits, okay, and when it exits, it creates that, that, uh, that concave uh, uh, center of that red blood cell. Uh, so, because of this, red blood cells, they usually live anywhere from 90 to 120 days before they end up getting recycled back, uh, before they end up getting recycled. So, uh, the nucleus has three main structures. It has uh, the nuclear envelope, the nucleoli, and chromatin. And we're going to be looking at all these three uh, individual structures next, moving forward. Over here in this picture, this is uh, the nucleus. So notice that you have this, it's a double layered membrane now. Notice you have the outer layer, and then this is the inner layer. So the outer layer, uh, it started with the ribosomes also. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it's continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and again, just like the rough ER uh, that has a, a cytoplasm, uh, the, the, the ribosome studded to it, uh, nuclear, uh, the nucleus does as well. Also notice that you have these pores. Now these pores, they're guarded by some, uh, by a, um, a complex of, uh, of proteins that are called the nuclear pore complex. And they regulate uh, uh, like large proteins, for example, from going out. Uh, so they, 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 they transport uh, things in and out of the, the, the nucleus. This darker area is the nucleolus. And then this is where the, the, the chromatin, it's condensed chromatin that you're looking at over here. Um, what else? Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, gonna be, we're going to be talking about the, the fluid that you find here also. Uh, there's a lot of other structures that, that, that's not seen here, but we're going to be talking about it in the next few slides. But this is the, the, you know, the, the main structures of the cell. You have the nucleolus, and you have the, the, the outer membrane, and then you have the chromatin. The envelope, it's a double membrane barrier that encloses uh, the nucleus. Uh, so this is the, the outer wall. Um, inside, 
you, it contains uh, a fluid that's called the nucleoplasm. So the nucleoplasm is it's it's uh it's similar to the cytosol. Uh, it also contains uh, salts, nutrients, and other essential solutes. And the outer layer is continuous with the rough ER, and just like the rough ER, it has the the ribosomes uh, attached to it, as we saw in the, in the last uh, in the last slide. The inner layer. Uh, it's uh, called the, the, the nuclear lamina, and it's a network of proteins. And what this does is that it, uh, it, uh, it maintains uh, the shape and acts as a scaffolding uh, for the DNA. The pores, uh, now they allow substance to pass into and out of the nucleus, the nuclear pores. And remember, they're guarded by a complex of proteins that are called the, the nuclear pore complex. Uh, so usually larger molecules is what's going to be transported through these pores. So in this slide, again, we're looking at a nucleus, and again, this is the surface and uh, of the nuclear uh, envelope. So uh, this is a fracture line of the outer membrane, and this what we're looking at. These are the the pores over here. So now, when you take a close up over here, this is uh, you can see these pores, and that's over here, and then you can see uh, the rings of uh, the proteins over here, the particles that are making up. Now this uh, photograph over here, this is showing the, the, inner, the, the inner lining, the nuclear lamina. And you can see these intermediate filaments uh, uh, that are forming uh, these lamin, uh, this net-like uh, structure over here. So the nucleoli, these are dark staining, uh, non-membrane bound uh, spherical bodies that we find within the nucleus. Uh, they're involved in RNA or ri ribosomal RNA synthesis and ribosomal subunit assembly. Now, nucleoli, they're associated with nuclear organizer regions, which contain the DNA that issues a genetic instruction for synthesizing uh, our, uh, the uh, ribosomal RNA. As molecules of the RNA are synthesized, uh, they're combined with proteins to form one of the two kinds of ribosomal subunits. There's usually one or two uh, of these nucleoli per cell. So chromatin, chromatin is made up of 30% of thread-like strands of DNA, 60% uh, histone proteins, and about 10% RNA. Uh, they're arranged in fundamental units called nucleosomes. And these nucleosomes, they're made up of eight histones that are wrapped around uh, twice around the uh, DNA. Chemical alterations of histones, they have an effect on DNA and they can uh, help regulate uh, gene, gene expression. So for example, uh, the presence of a methyl group on histone proteins, it can shut down the near, nearby DNA. Uh, or attachments of phosphate groups to particular histone protein, uh, they could indicate indicated the cells about to undergo apoptosis. So when chromatin is condensed, they're referred to as chromosomes. Now, the only time you're gonna see chromosomes is during cell division and the reason that the chromatin, uh, the, the chromatin condenses is to help protect that fragile uh, chromatin during the dividing process. So what you're seeing here is a chromosome. And this chromosome is, um, chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. Okay? Now in this, when the cell is about to, when the cell is, uh, about to divide, and this guy has chromosomes, uh, you know, it's, uh, the chromatin in this state, we're saying that it's, it's, it's condensed, it's super coiled. Uh, all right. And uh, that's about it for this chapter. Uh, so uh, this is it for chapter three. Uh, I hope you found it helpful. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Please share it and su subscribe to the channel. If you would like an exam review, again, please leave me an email or uh, leave it in the comments be below. And I'll be, uh, I'll be more than happy to work on them for you guys. Uh, thank you for watching. Best of luck on your exams and your courses that you're taking.